Let's start with the amount of new money going out the door. There's $52.9 billion in new spending in this budget over the next five years. So where's that money coming from? Well, the government is proposing to raise the capital gains tax on the wealthiest 0.13% of Canadians and on corporations. Also, the economy, it's been forming better than expected, and that means higher government revenues. So where does that leave the federal deficit? Well, it's largely unchanged from the fall forecast of $40 billion, and it is projected to stay below that in the years ahead. But there is still no projected path back to balance. At its core, this is a plan the Liberals say will help fix the housing crisis, as they're proposing a $23 billion program to get nearly 4 million homes built between now and 2031. That's through $8 billion in new spending and $15 billion in construction loans. There are also some nuggets in this budget that they hope will spur growth, including a new electric vehicle supply chain tax credit that will amount to a 10% credit on the cost of any building that builds EVs or builds the batteries that power them. The government is also announcing uh, the long-awaited carbon rebate for small and medium-sized businesses. It will see $2.5 billion being delivered directly to 600,000 businesses. Now, the leaders of each opposition party have delivered their reaction to the budget, some saying they will not support it. Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget. It is getting too hot and too expensive for Canadians. None of our conditions have been respected, so we, of course, vote against it. There's things in the budget that we, we fought for that are there. There's problems that we have. I want to hear what the plan is from the Prime Minister to address my concerns. The budget falls far short of our hopes. Okay, that's the politicians. Now we're going to hear from some experts. Jimmy Jean is the chief economist at Desjardins. Armin Yalnizian is the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Work at the Atkinson Foundation. And sitting in the middle there is Sahir Khan, the executive vice president at the University of Ottawa's Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy. Hello, gang. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, Jimmy, I, I wonder if I can start with you. The, you heard Pierre Polyev there call this a wasteful and inflationary budget, but inflation's under 3% for the third month as the budget comes out. Where are we on inflation? What does all of this tell us about the state of Canada's economy right now? Well, we were relieved with uh, the numbers we saw this morning, 2.9%. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, when you think about the uh, surprise we had in the U.S., it's good news to uh, have this sense that the Bank of Canada is still on track to cut rates uh, starting in June and to cut them uh, several times this year. Now, uh, it's true as well that this budget relies on a lot of hope for this year in terms of economic growth and hope that ties to uh, that prospect of interest rate cuts. Uh, I, would, uh, I would argue that, uh, you know, there's a lot of scope for us to be disappointed by uh, how the economy performs versus those expectations particularly as we get into 2025 and 2026. And that's because this budget doesn't include assumptions on the reduction in non-permanent resident admissions. Mm -hmm. And that's a significant impact on growth in our view. So, see so here, uh, that's sort of the economic picture. On the fiscal side of things, $52.9 billion in new spending. We hope that number's accurate because you helped us come up with it inside the budget briefing today. So we're counting on you here. Uh, there have been concerns raised about the spending, that this could uh, affect inflation or maybe that this isn't sustainable. What's your sense of how this new spending fits into that bigger picture? Yeah, I, I think the minister was right in, in kind of meeting the, the fiscal anchor test that she set out for herself. I don't think they're particularly high bars, mm -hmm. but there are a couple of real issues with the level of spending. Uh, one is we haven't recovered a lot of the space that was lost kind of, uh, during the, the pandemic. Uh, that fiscal room doesn't kind of set us up for a crisis or any difficulty softening the economy in the future. And the second thing is um, whether we're getting the, the outcomes that we expect out of this level of spending. There's a big shift from the, the Chrétien, Martin, Harper days when spending was about 12 to 13 percent of GDP. And this is now, for the Liberal government, sustainably kind of at 15 to 16 percent. So the state's bigger, and with that comes expectations. And I think they've struggled on public administration, uh, and that delivery is kind of what tugs at public confidence over time, particularly in the third term. So this is, I think, something that's going to be difficult for this government to kind of overcome in the next 18 months. But kind of under the hood, it's not just the absolute level of spending. It's definitely a bigger government, a bigger state. But real, real issues around performance and, and what results are getting for, for the amount of money that's going into this economy.
So Armin, let's pick up on that point, the outcomes, the expectations, and the performance. The government has set out this budget's framework as fairness for every generation, in particular focus at younger Canadians who have lost hope on having that good life of owning a home and, you know, child care and these things. Where do you think they are on this in terms of delivering the, the program offerings on that and their ability to, to deliver on the actual results? Well, really, the home run uh, in the last week and in the budget today was about housing. And housing particularly focused on renters, which has been a long time coming and has been really the pain point for many, many Canadians, including the people that are, are refinancing their mortgages and finding it impossible to hang on to home ownership and moving into the rental market. So really welcome news. And just to put everybody's concerns uh, a little bit to bed, more than half the lion's share of the housing spending will be in the form of federal loans. So taxpayers will be getting that money back at some point uh, because most, most of these loans pay up. So that was really good news. I, for, from my perspective, to Sahir's comment about it being around the 15-16% of GDP mark in terms of federal spending, it is a lot of cash, that's for sure. But that's roughly where we were before the Mulroney, Chrétien, and Harper era. Like, we're just going back to where we were. And frankly, in given demographics, it will be very, very hard to keep governments small. Uh, as we move forward already, when you take a look at what is growing the most rapidly, it's elderly benefits. That is like chewing up a lot. There's not much they can cut because so much of what they spend are transfers to provinces and transfers to persons, and these are statutorily set and they're inflation adjusted. So they have less wiggle room than any government has less wiggle room that, than they would like coming into the game. So, so, Jimmy, on that point, um, the, the, the pandemic, obviously, the, the taking on of the debt at the federal level to avoid, you know, so, some poorer provinces just not being able to deal with it has led to a lot of these challenges. But on, the, on that benefit side that our meme points to, by the end of this um, fiscal cycle, the projections they have in the budget, benefits to the elderly are $100 billion on a $540 billion budget. So where does the increased debt, we're seeing, you know, debt servicing costs going up to $64 billion by that year, uh, eclipsing what we transfer to the provinces from the federal government on health care next year, and then $100 billion in pension benefits to, to the elderly. What kind, of, what kind of a fiscal situation is the government facing over the next few years? Well, uh, indeed, uh, you have uh, some of those mandatory uh, spending items uh, that are uh, set in the budget, but you also have uh, some other mandatory uh, urgencies like uh, like climate, like uh, shelter. So those are areas where, you know, you can't. You're facing a housing crisis. You have to do something about it. So that's why they're they're, they're spending, uh, and they're also using their their balance sheet. That's an important point that Armin made uh, because uh, we're seeing record amount of bond that will have to be issued to support not just the deficit, but the, the fact that you, you, you have a bunch of loans that you need to finance uh, in order to, right. to, to offer. Uh, but that illustrates the, uh, the importance of being parsimonious and to being that focus on generating spending that can grow revenue and not, you know, you know uh, tax uh, capital gains and that, that sort of stuff because, uh, you know, ultimately it's a competitive advantage that we end up uh, losing or eroding. But, you know, really driving in, honing in on productivity, on investment, and that's been the call for so many years. And what can you say has been done to address that in a convincing way today? Nothing. Well, that, that, let me just stay with you, Jimmy, if I can, because that's the criticism from Goldie Hyder, in that he, he's been calling for a productivity and a growth strategy uh, from his uh, perch at the Business Council of Canada for quite some time. Says he's not really seeing that here. The investment tax credits, which they broadly support as a response to the Inflation Reduction Act, are still not completely enforced or still not completely fleshed out. So, so where are they on this? There's some argument uh, from finance people today that investing in housing will help productivity because you can't be productive if you can't get workers and you can't get workers if they don't have a house. But where does that fit into that picture? from your perspective? Well, you know, the housing thing, it, we have to remember, it's going to be very long term. Uh, you have uh, such a wide supply gap. And, you know, many of those uh, housing announcements, uh, you, you have no certainty 
as to what will be the take-up rate on those loans or, you know, what kind of partnerships you'll be able to uh, broker with the uh, provinces and municipalities uh, whom on a lot of those measures you uh, rely on to actually execute. And we know executing is not something that government has been known to, to do very well. So, uh, you know, I'm not very convinced that we'll be able to unlock productivity uh, in this fashion. It's really, you know, you look at regulation. This is somewhere you don't even have to think about spending that much money. If you deregulate smartly, if you lift a bunch of obstacles that exist and that have been, you know, people have been vocal about these for a long time and nothing has really moved on this front. Uh, you know, you can generate a lot of uh, productivity, efficiency, uh, growth in, you know, within Canada and in interprovincial trading, uh, for example. Uh, right. So all those things don't require a whole lot of money and they're not still not being done. No, but they, they take goodwill and cooperation and so here they, they take execution. And as you said right off the top, the, one of the challenges for this government is executing on these things in a way that's timely and tangible and delivers results. And housing is going to be a real test for them, right? Because they don't control all of the levers on that. Uh, they don't necessarily have the labor pool. They need to deliver on it. So how com confident uh, do you think people should be that, that this plan, as ambitious as it is, can deliver the results that is promising? Well, well, first of all, I, I don't blame the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister, for doing a strategy on housing. Mm -hmm. um, this is something the Premier should have done. And, and, and didn't. And so, you know, if you're a citizen, you're, you're, not out, you're not reading the Constitution every day trying to figure out who's responsible for what. You expect your political leadership to take action. Um, you know, as Jimmy mentioned, there are things that could have been done, you know, uh, or he mentioned to be, you know, as mentioned in earlier um, broadcasts that, you know, immigration, other things could have been tackled sooner. But we are where we are. Mm. Uh, I think there's a certain urgency to doing this politically, probably all levels of government that might get this file moving better than others. It might put the pressure back on premiers and, and municipalities and the nimbyism uh, to kind of say, well, you know what, this is where a little bit of moral suasion at the federal level might get some action going. But but it's tough coming from the federal government to try to influence something that's really gummed up um, at the municipal level. Uh, but they're going to try. And, and probably that's all that we have left. I just give it the good old college try. That That's where we are, so here you think, when it comes to housing? You know, this is the type of thing that required three orders of government to kind of cooperate, and they didn't get there. Yeah. Right? And, and years of planning to kind of collaborate. And when, when things kind of break down, this is the result. So you have the federal government that has the resources. The provinces really have the authority, and the municipalities are the problem. And, and the other two don't want to step up, and the federal government's going to try to do something. So I don't blame them for trying. Yeah, and I mean, it's an interesting political dynamic that they were getting yelled at for a year for doing nothing, and now they're getting yelled at for doing everything, it seems, or just about everything. But, you, you know, some of it, you, you mentioned rental housing, right? So, like, you know, there's home ownership and there's having just somewhere to live at a price you can afford. And, and we saw movement on purpose-built, like, apartment rentals last year when they removed the GST uh, on those constructions. And so you can see... There was an immediate increase based on that change. Now there's the loan program, so low interest loans. So, you know, if the tax is gone and capital is cheaper, that should help on the apartment side. But where do you think they are in the housing mix? Like a lot of young people want to own their own home, and right now they can't. Do you, do you, when you look at the plans to help with supply and affordability, what do you see? Well, I guess I see that this is something too late. So it's great that they're acting now. It should have been done much earlier and what's really fascinating right now is how political this document is it really is an effort of the liberals to woo back the gen z gen z and millennial um voters that brought them to the party and they want them back because they're being wooed by another party that will not help them on their housing front and it's really trying to create a space to say okay Axe the tax, go ahead and cut spending because you think that somehow we are in charge of inflation <coughs> by spending on housing. But what are you going to do about people's housing needs? And can I just touch on that inflationary uh, issue? We are talking about 52.9. Thank you, Sahir. $52.9 <laughs> uh, billion dollars in new spending over the next five years. Every year we spend almost half a trillion dollars. We're talking about a rounding error in the federal budget, much less 
uh, the economy as a whole. There's no way this new spending is big enough to trigger an inflationary fear. And the problem is if you don't deal with the commodification of housing, that's a different source of inflation yeah. that affects everybody. So something needed to be done. At least there's, there's options for people to talk about now, which is, I think, the point of this document. They looked at the calendar and they thought, we better start talking to the people that might be voting for us pretty soon. We, we have to bring them something that they need, and housing is one of them. Right, but, but I mean, just to stick with you, housing is also just a, a fundamental challenge for society right now that is going to take spending by somebody to get it done, right? So it, 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 it's kind of an unavoidable choice well, at this point in time. Frankly, if, if the federal, first of all, the federal government has the lowest borrowing costs, it is the appropriate level of government to borrow to save us all money. But if governments don't borrow, if the next government comes in and says, we're not doing this sort of thing, it's inflationary, then what you're saying is basically the debt, which we have the lowest debt to GDP ratio in Canada of any of the G7 nations. We're the 11th out of the 29 richest countries. If we don't take on more debt, we're going to reverse that story and bring the group that has the most household debt in the world, Canadian households, mm -hmm. we're going to ask them to take on more debt. So watch, you know, pick your poison. You either do something for households and ask them uh, to take care of themselves or you do something to help them take care of themselves. One way or another, debt will be involved, whether it's government debt or household debt. And the question is not passing it on to children, it's sticking it to the parents right now, if that's where we end up. So, so Jimmy, just a question on the inflationary uh, impact of, of this spending. Uh, I mean, you said earlier you don't think necessarily this budget in and of itself is going to be much of a challenge, especially not where we are now, that it's somewhere between 2 and 3% and likely to stay in that range. But when you stack this on top of Ontario's $10 billion deficit, Quebec's $11 billion deficit, British Columbia's $8 billion deficit, and round numbers, it all starts to add up in terms of spending going into the economy. So, so what kind of a role do you think government spending writ large could play in, in, in the Bank of Canada's fight here? Well, it's true you're seeing uh, higher deficits, uh, but we have to remember the economy was weaker uh, than, uh, th than expected in many of those, those provinces. Uh, and also, uh, in many of those provinces are dealing with, uh, with wage increases. They've seen also a higher cost for, for wildfires and, and uh, natural disasters. You know, uh, uh, a bunch of, uh, of, of one-off uh, factors that have contributed to those, uh, mm -hmm. those weaker uh, profiles. So I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing the kind of spending that was worrying two years ago. And by that, I mean uh, checks to, to households or grocery rebates, uh, things that, you know, could, you could make an argument that in a state of excess demand, that contributes to add oil to the fire. You're not seeing that. And uh, you know, to that uh, matter, you have uh, uh, an economy that's in a state of excess capacity right now. The Bank of Canada says we're, we have an output gap of 1%. So that affords the federal government, you know, uh, a little bit of wiggle room, I would agree, to, to spend without generating excess uh, inflation. Uh, now, ha having said that, it's still the case that the best way to control inflation over the long term is to generate productivity, is to grow the supply side of the economy and uh, grow the productive uh, potential of the economy, which can generate uh, higher wages and also strong growth without the inflation. And that's why we're harping on this, and that's right. why it's disappointing not to see measures to really tackle and really focus on that. Okay, uh, we're, we're running out of time, so I, I want to thank you all uh, for your help with us in the internal briefing by the Department of Finance today and on the show today and on every other time you appear here on Power and Politics to, to bring your insight and your expertise. So Jimmy John, Sihir Khan, Armin Yalnizian, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.